Good morning. Today we have with us for about two seconds before she leaves, Reese. She was sitting here, but the second I start talking, she wants to move. So, bye, girl. Now, what we're going to do for Read Aloud today is we are going to read chapters 11 through 10 plus 3. Now, I know that that's a weird chapter number. It doesn't make any sense. But if you think of what 10 plus 3 equals, 13. Matthew doesn't like the number 13. He thinks it's an unlucky number. So any chance he has to say 13, he just says 10 plus 3. And he says that as fast as possible so that people don't realize that he's not liking to say the word 13. Yesterday when we were reading, something that um, we were kind of made aware of was that Matthew wants to go ahead and determine what happened to Teddy Dawson. And he wants to go ahead and take some time and find him and find, maybe find Teddy and maybe, probably, hopefully... Find out who took Teddy. All right, so we're going to get into this reading today. I'm excited. It's going to be a little bit of a longer chunk, I think, so bear with me, okay? And I'm going to be drinking a lot of water because my throat gets dry when reading extended books. All right. Chapter 11, The Search Party. I was shaking as I stood over the bathroom sink. It had been hours since I'd last washed my hands. I'd lost track of things and not kept on top of keeping clean. And now I was in danger of becoming sick. And if I became sick, who knew what that could lead to? I washed my hands over and over and over until my eyes streamed from pain. I went to my room and I was going to put on a pair of latex gloves on, but then I realized I had to save them. Someone's got him lying, I said to the wallpaper. Someone has taken him. I am sure of it. The wallpaper lion looked back at me sadly. I need to be alert. I need to keep an eye on things. See if I can spot any clues. You need someone like me watching things. I was the last to see him. If I hadn't seen him, they wouldn't have known he was in the front yard at all, would they? I began a new page in my notebook. Teddy's disappearance. The facts. So, I just love that change. I think that that's a really cool text structure detail that they do. That you have just like a running thought process here and then you can see what he's writing. I think that that is such a unique thing that authors can do. Mr. Charles wasn't coping very well with his grandchildren and now seems worried about his fish. Casey pushed Teddy in the pond and showed no signs of wanting to help him until Mr. Charles appeared. Old Nina, could she be saved? Could she be involved? Jake Bishop, could he be capable of hurting Teddy? Maybe hiding Teddy for attention? Melody Bird, an unlikely suspect, but she does go to the graveyard a lot. Would she know of some place to hide him over there? The first search party returned at 7.18 p.m. They hung around in the middle of the street for a while, not quite sure what to do next. The police were still going in and out of Mr. Charles's house. Gordon turned toward home, fanning his scarlet face with his wide-brimmed hat as he went. Jake opened the door of number five, swigging from a can of Coke as Sue walked up to him and grabbed him in an awkward bear hug. He looked up at me over his her shoulder and glared. Claudia went back to number three and Melody opened the door. Frankie yapped at their feet as they hugged as well. Mom turned to our house and looked up at the window. I held up my hand and gave a pathetic wave as she smiled weakly. I stood at the top of the stairs when she came in. How did it go? Did you find anything? Mom shook her head and then rubbed the back of her neck with her hand. She looked tired. I can't believe this is happening, that poor family. Is your dad still out? I nodded. Dad had come home from work to find the police everywhere. He'd thrown his tie and briefcase into the hallway and rushed to join another search team along with Jake's brother, Leo, 
who recently returned home from work, and Mr. Jenkins, who must have returned from his run when I wasn't watching. He didn't call up to let me know he was going like Mom had. I actually thought he forgot that I was there at all. Mom leaned her head against the front door and closed her eyes. You know what I need right now, Matthew? I need a big hug from my lovely, lovely son. Her eyes remained closed as she took a deep breath. I'd stayed still at the top of the stairs as I watched her. In her mind, she was probably willing me to walk down the stairs to take her hand as I rested my head on the little dip of her shoulder and her collarbone. She would then envelop me in her hug, strong arms, as we stood there breathing in and out with each other. Her eyes flickered open as they glistened as she looked up at me, sitting on the top step frozen to the spot. I think I'll put on a kettle of tea, she said, and she made her way to the kitchen. So right there in that moment, we notice another relationship aspect of Matthew and his mom. We notice that Matthew's mom is being very respectful in understanding that um, Matthew doesn't like germs and doesn't like to be touched because of germs, but she's also kind of letting him know, like, hey, this is actually something I need, and she knows when she closes her eyes, it's like her way of knowing that he's not going to walk down the stairs, and he's not going to hug his mom. And I don't think it's because he doesn't want to. Like, I think that he wants to hug his mom. I think that he wants to show her love. But I think that he is caught up in that cleanliness aspect that he's just not going to. And he even says, me sitting on the top step, frozen to the spot. So he is warring with himself. He wants to give his mom that hug. And he's not. So he has this constant battle inside of wanting to be the good son to his mom, but at the same time having this compulsion to stay clean all day, right? When I was five, we used to walk to school each day with Sue and Jake. Jake would usually have some kind of makeshift weapon on him, and he'd use to attack any shrub or hedge he thought could do with a good bashing, whereas... I'd walk beside my mom, holding her hand. Maddie, Maddie, let's have a war, he'd yell, thrusting a sharp stick at my chest. I'd turn away from him and... and nestled against my mom's leg. It wasn't that I didn't want to play. I just wanted to stay close to my mom for as long as I could before I went to class. I don't think he wants to today, Jake, mom said kindly. Jake huffed and ran and began whacking a bush with his stick. We carried on walking, and I put my other hand over the top of hers, covering her soft knuckles. Jake, why don't you hold my hand like Matthew? Said Sue, grabbing his arm, trying to stop him from hitting a bush. Jake scowled and tugged his arm away, then studied his palm. His pink, angry skin seemed to hypnotize him, and he stopped to, to pick the little white flakes. Don't do that. You'll make your eczema sore. You don't want to make it sore, do you? Sue dropped behind to inspect her son's hand as Mom and I walked on. Do you know what? Mom said. One day you'll be a really big boy and you won't hold your mom's hand anymore. I froze and frowned and she laughed. It's true. Us mommies know these things. Swinging her arms back and swinging our arms back and forth, I giggled as sh we marched onward like clockwork soldiers. I I will always hold your hand, mommy. I said after we slowed down. I promise, even when I'm twelve years old. Hmm. Mom laughed so much that this time I saw her bright white teeth. We'll see, Matthew. We'll see. And then she squeezed my hand a little tighter. So that was a memory from when he was five. And we think back to the few moments before, he is 12, and he's not holding his mom's hand. So this is a memory of him realizing that his mom was right, that he wasn't going to hold his mom's hand when, when they were older. At <laughs> Reese's meowing in the background. At 7.30 p.m., a woman wearing a smart blue dress 
and light gray jacket stood in the front of number 11 and spoke into the camera microphone. A man with a large camera on his shoulders filmed her. I couldn't hear what she was saying, but she kept turning toward Mr. Charles's house and pointing, and then she held up a large piece of paper, which must have been Teddy's photograph. It was all over in ten minutes. As soon as she finished the report, she took off her gray jacket and fanned her face. The police officer in a suit approached them, and I thought he was going to ask them to leave, but he seemed pleased to see them and shook their hands before checking his watch. After they left... Officer Campen appeared carrying a roll of yellow tape. Remember, Officer Campen was the officer that uh, asked um, Matthew quite a few questions. He spoke to a few passers-by who were hanging around outside Gordon and Penny's house, and they drifted off toward the end of the road. 743. Still no sign of Teddy Dawson. The police are now taping off the end of Chestnut Close. Penny Sullivan from number one was walking around the, the cul-de-sac with a tray of orange juice. Ice cold orange juice, she said to each person. Something to cool you down, officer? Some of them waved her away with a nod and a smile. Some were too busy to speak to her, and a few took the glass and drank the cold juice in one go. Penny returned to number one, probably looking through her kitchen cupboards to see what other refreshments that she could muscle up. The other search party came back at 8.17. Dad had his shirt sleeves rolled up and was carrying his suit jacket over his shoulder. Jake's older brother, Leo, was talking on his phone, and Rory Jenkins was eating some sort of nutrition bar. He looked up at me as he crossed the road toward his house, and I stared back. Eating at the time like this didn't seem right. He brushed the crumbs from the front of his t-shirt, watching me all the, all the time. Hannah came out to meet him and put her hands around her husband's face and kissed him. He threw a heavy arm around her shoulder and they walked slowly back to the house. Hannah's huge stomach was swaying from side to side. The sight of it made me feel sick, so I went to the bathroom and splashed some cold water on my face until I felt better. Dad came in telling Mom that they'd found nothing and that they'd shut off the end of the road so that no one could come onto the cul-de-sac without permission. I heard them move to the kitchen and start on dinner. The door of number three opened and Melody jumped down the step and skipped across the road. I groaned. She was heading straight towards us. Hello, Melody love, Mom said quietly when she opened the door. Go on up. I'm sure Matthew would like some company right now. I wouldn't. I wouldn't like any company right now. Hi, Maddie, Melody said as if it was just another day and nothing had happened. Like a small child, with nothing like a small child going missing. She came into the office and looked around, staring at the elephant mobile. Oh, wow. Is your mom having another baby? She spun the mobile with her finger and the elephants hurtled around. No, look. Can you not do that, please? The elephants went faster and faster until two of them became tangled up, and she stopped. So, what's all this stuff, then? She poked about the bags under the mobile. It was for my brother. He died. Look, can you not touch anything, please? Melanie stood up. Died? What do you mean he died? He died, okay? What do you want, Melody? I stood with my arms folded. I wonder if she'd do... What she would do if she knew that he died because of me. I could tell her just like that. It was my fault, Melody. Now, will you go away and stop bothering me? She sat on the edge of the desk. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Her face looked sad. That must be hard for you. I nodded. In my head, I was making a mental note of everything I needed to clean after she was gone. Edge of door, frame, hold door, elephant we feel. How can I clean that? Desk. Clear everything off and blast with antibacterial spray. Did you see the news people here earlier? My mom thinks he's wandered off somewhere. Do you or do you think someone has taken him? I shrugged. I would have thought if he'd wandered off, he would have been found by now, I said. She picked up my notebook, which was next to her desk. Oh, wow, this is brilliant. You've got everything here. You should show this to the police. 5.23 p.m., Mr. Charles is moving, mowing his law again. It's the fifth time this week. She giggled as she turned a few more pages. I stepped 
stepped across the room. Can you give that back to me? It's private. 1002, old Nina is watering her pots. Turning the last page, she read what I had written in silence, then glanced up at me. Her face looked horrified. Looking down again, she read aloud. Melody Bird, an unlikely suspect, but she does go to the graveyard a lot. Would she know of some place to hide him over there? I jiggled around in front of her, wanting to snatch the book back, but not quite finding the courage to do it. Matthew, do you think I took Teddy? I, I, no, no, of course not. I quickly grabbed the book from her, forgetting I wasn't wearing any gloves. Her mouth hung open. It's nothing, Melody. I was just bored, writing stuff, some stuff down. It's not important. But, but I don't understand. Why do you think I did it? I don't know. I just wondered why you'd go to the graveyard so much. That's all. I was just, I just thought there may be something over there you were hiding. It doesn't matter. I was just writing anything down. I dropped the notebook onto the desk. Melanie put her hands on her hips and she came toward me. I didn't take Teddy Dawson and I can't believe you'd say such a thing. I thought we were friends. I pressed myself against the window sill. That's the first I've heard about it. Melody gasped, and then she spun around and ran downstairs. We're going to pause there for a second. So he, I don't think Matthew quite realizes the impact that his person affects other people. When we think about his parents, his parents aren't allowed to give him a hug and play with him and play catch with him and do the parent and kid things that you do. Like for me growing up, I played catch with my dad every single day. He wanted me to be a softball pitcher. Now I didn't end up being a pitcher, but I played catch with him every single day. Something I did with my mom was that we would go grocery shopping together and I would help. I would run down certain aisles and grab the things before she could get them so that it would help her out. And it was fun for me, right? His impact on his parents is that he they don't get the opportunity to kind of really be parents to him and in this moment here with melody it's kind of like he doesn't realize that she is extending herself to him melody is trying to extend a relationship to matt and matt's refusing um not in not intentionally but i think he's really just unaware of someone actually wanting to show him kindness Chapter 12, TV Debut. I made my TV debut at 9.03 p.m. Mom screamed upstairs at me, Maddie, quick, get down here. I jumped off my bed, and for a few blissful seconds, it felt like I was just running downstairs for dinner, like I used to. Dad was standing by the conservatory door eating a bag of chips. Mom was perched on the edge of our cream leather sofa, staring at the large flat screen. He's just wandered off, that's all, Dad said. They'll find him. He'll be home before it gets dark, you mark my words. I glanced out at the yard. It was getting dark already. Dad tipped the chip, the chips bag up and shook some crumbs into his mouth. I hated it when he did that. Where would he have gone, though, Brian? We've looked everywhere. Penny said sh they are searching the building site near the old swimming pool now. There was a large new development of houses being built on that edge of town, and I was picturing Teddy toddling along, staring up at that giant dinosaur-like cranes. He could have, could he have been so hypnotized by them, he missed a deep crater and fell in? It was unlikely. The whole area was pretty secure with high fencing. And besides, it was busy around here, around there. Surely someone would have spotted a little boy wearing a diaper all his own. Mom jumped out of her seat and pointed at the TV. Look, it's on! The woman was standing on our street talking into the microphone. I recognized her as a reporter wearing the gray jacket who'd been standing outside just before the police taped off the road. 
15-month-old boy was last seen wearing a pull-up style diaper and a white t-shirt with a picture of an ice cream cone on the front. The police believe he may have been holding a blue square security blanket and wasn't wearing any shoes. She was holding a laminated photograph in one hand and as the camera zoomed in, Teddy's face filled the screen. He was wearing a white shirt with fan- with a fancy waistcoat around it. Around his neck was a crumpled gold necktie that he'd clearly tried to yank off. His pale blue eyes were glistening with recent tears, possibly brought on from being stuffed into an outfit that made him look like a miniature magician. It had been a long time since I had seen the TV this close up, and it was making my eyes water. Dad scrunched up the bag in his hand, and a few tiny grubs fell onto the carpet. I needed to get back to my room. I turned to go, but then Mom leaped out of the seat. Matthew, you're on TV! The camera pulled back, and the reporter pointed at Mr. Dawson's lawn. Last seen playing on his grandfather's front yard here at Chestnut Close. The, in the top left-hand corner of the screen was our house, and in the upstairs window stood a figure. It was me. I was just standing there, like an idiot, thinking nobody could possibly be looking at me. What do you watch up there all day, son? You looking for birds or something? Ornithology? Mom gave him a glare. I ignored them. The police are calling for anyone with information to get in touch with the the incident room at. The screen cut to the phone number and Mom turned to me patting the sofa beside her. Why don't you stay down here with us this evening? Watch a bit of TV to take off your mind your mind off of everything. I don't expect we'll get much sleep tonight. No, not tonight, thanks, I said. Mom stood up, and I had a feeling she was going to try and touch me, so I quickly dodged around her and ran upstairs to wash my hands. Eleven squirts of antibacterial soap, some scalding hot water, and nine washes later, I felt a bit better. It was still busy outside with the police coming and going. Charles's front yard looked like a bizarre gift-wrapped present. The front wall and gate were draped in yellow tape. An officer I hadn't seen before stood guard at the door. Mr. Jenkins and Hannah were in their in their own yard, his arm draped heavily around her shoulder. I wonder if she knew what horrible teacher her husband was. I had... I don't suppose it was the kind of thing he mentioned at home. Hello, darling. I made a boy cry during gym today. It was that weird kid next door. He said he had to wash his hands after throwing one javelin. Can you believe that? I told him he was on a pathway to failure if he carried on like this. He'd be a failure for the rest of his life. The thought of the PE lesson made my eyes fill with tears, but I blinked them away, refusing to cry again. Hannah turned around and saw I saw her huge pregnant stomach, so I quickly looked away. The computer trumpeted an email again. To Matthew Corbin from Melody Bird, urgent. If you're going to investigate Teddy's disappearance properly, you're going to need my help. Melody. I read the email over a few times. I responded, what? I ran into my room and grabbed a new bottle of water. Next door's backyard was surrounded by four industrial lamps ready for when darkness fell. Three police officers stood on the patio discussing something. I went back to the office drinking half of the water as I read Melody's next email. Well, you're not doing a very good job so far by making wild accusations about me. And I'm not being rude here, but you don't go out and you don't do much from your house, can you? You're going to need someone at street level, someone to do the actual investigating. I quickly type back. And I'm supposed that someone is you? I found that I was smiling as I hit send. Yes, face it, Matthew. You can't do it without me. I'm willing to forgive you for what you wrote in your notebook. I understand that you need to write your ideas down, even if that one is incredibly stupid. She inserted an emoji where the face is all screwed up. (laughs) I responded back, Melanie Bird, you are definitely one of a kind. A few seconds later, her reply pinged open on the screen. I know. When do we start? I sat there for two minutes thinking. 
Suspects number one and two are Mr. Charles and Casey. See if you can get into their house tomorrow. Make an excuse, take over a cake or something, maybe do some snooping around. See what mood he's in. Does he seem too happy considering his grandson has disappeared? Is Casey acting like the girl whose brother is missing? To Melody, aye aye, Captain, I'll go now. Over and out. She was bonkers. To Melody from Corbin, maybe now isn't the best time. It's late and the police are busy there, etc. Leave it until the morning. I, I hit send, and she didn't reply. But then, fifteen minutes later, she came out of her house balancing. A plate along her forearm. As she crossed the road, I could see it was some kind of long sponge cake. And on top, she'd randomly st- stuck loads of chocolate lady f- fingers. It looked like a strange, spiky caterpillar. I cringed, wishing I hadn't said anything. Oh, Melody. I whispered to myself. <laughs> the policemen on the doorstep were gone. And she struggled to unlock Mr. Charles's gate with one hand her tongue sticking out the corner of her mouth as she concentrated on keeping the cake on a plate. As she got to the front door, she glanced at my window and gave me a thumbs up. I groaned as I sat back down on the desk. I couldn't bear to watch. Ten minutes later, she was sprinting across the cul-de-sac, an empty plate smeared with chocolate in her hand. I waited on the computer. The whole cake thing worked. Well done, you. He asked me to say, so I've got this. More emails. He asked me to say hello to Casey. Boy, that kid is creepy. She just sat in the corner playing with some horrible doll and didn't even look up. You were right. She certainly doesn't seem bothered about Teddy at all. To Melody. And what about Mr. Charles? Did he seem upset? Mm, Kind of. His eyes were red and... Like he'd been crying. There was one weird thing, though. He ate a gigantic slice of cake. Can you believe it? I thought stress killed an appetite. Anyway, let me know my next assignment. Over and out, Agent Mel. (laughs) I went across my room, and I laid on my bed. My arms beneath my head, staring up at the ceiling. So I guess. Where is he gone, Lion? Who's got it? The police had turned the lights on in Mr. Charles's yard, and they made a pattern on my wall. The yellow spotlight circled the wallpaper um, with the lion high up in his corner. He, his one puffed up cheek was grinning back at me like some tacky TV game show host. So, the question for you, Matthew Corbin, is this. Who exactly is to blame for the mysterious disappearance of Teddy Dawson? Is it A, Casey Dawson? This little darling may appear innocent, but she is has an unhealthy habit of pushing small children into ponds. Could she have done something with Teddy? B, Mr. Charles, grandfatherly love does not come easy to this old man. Could he be responsible for the missing boy? C, Jake Bishop, his bitter youth and gets a kick out of making others miserable. Could his attention-seeking have taken him a step too far? And D, Matthew Corbin. This strange, lonely boy seemed to believe it was okay to leave a 15-month-old alone in the front yard in soaring temperatures. And let's not forget, he did what he did to his baby brother Callum. So, who could it be? The choice is yours. So he was imagining that being like a game show host trying to determine, like, who done it? Who's the person? All right, we've got one more chapter for today, and it's chapter 10 plus 3. So it's right here, 10 plus 3. The Sleepover. Our doorbell rang, and I woke up with a gasp. <gasps> There's something terrifying about hearing a doorbell late at night. Our, <clears throat> I looked at my clock, 11, 10 plus 3, glowing in the fluorescent green, so 11, 13. Not good. I closed my eyes and held my breath for three sets of seven, listening to the police siren that became louder and faded as it passed the end of our street. When I opened my eyes, it was 11, 14. Whew. 
I breathed a sigh of relief. I am so sorry for that yawn. I could hear Mr. Charles on our doorstep talking to Dan. Going to the hospital for a checkup, probably just something I've eaten. Best to get it checked out. Mom is on a flight right now. Can you have her here tonight? Of course, no problem. Dad, the door closed and Dad's voice went all shaky, uh, squeaky. I recognized his talking to small kid's voice. We'll make you up a nice cozy bed in the spare room, okay? Just across the landing from Matthew. You know Maddie, don't you? I stepped out onto the landing. Mom was heading upstairs, her eyes wide. Mr. Charles has got chest pains, so the police are running him to the hospital to get it checked out. We've got Casey here for the night. Isn't that nice? No, not really, I responded. She ignored me and went into the nursery and began dragging the boxes of baby stuff out onto the landing. The elephant mobile was dumped on top, its string still tangled, five long years of dangling in limbo, and she'd gotten rid of it just like that. Brian, get Casey a glass of milk, would you? I peeked over the banister, and there she was, standing out on her doormat, wearing a long, old-fashioned looking nightdress and hugging a, a bedraggled doll. As she followed Dad to the kitchen, she glanced up at me, her eyes narrowing. Chest pains, I said. It's probably indigestion. What's he going to the hospital for? Mom frowned at me. When did you become a medical expert? She said, raising an eyebrow. I shrugged. A big slab of cake Melanie delivered was enough to give anyone chest pains. Can't she sleep downstairs on the sofa? Mom exhaled and she dumped the final box and up with a tiny puff of dust dispersed into the air. What are you talking about, Matthew? You, you really do say the strangest things sometimes. How can I let a small child sleep downstairs on her own, especially after her little brother has gone missing? She wiped her forehead. Where's the foam mattress gone? That will do. She wandered off to her room, and I paced around on the landing. I could hear Dad squeaking away to Casey downstairs about that devil cat. Isn't he a silly Nigel, eh, Casey? Who ever heard of a cat who likes to sleep on a pool table? Would you like a cookie? Oh, no, actually, you better not, since you probably brushed your teeth already. Sheila, you done yet? Mom reappeared, dragging our dusty old foam bed, which has seen better days. I danced around her, trying to block her way. Without actually touching anything, she left a trail of yellow foam behind her. She doesn't even know us. I whispered, how can Mr. Charles leave her with a family she doesn't know? Shouldn't social services be called? Mom shuffled the bed into the room and positioned it in the corner near her desk computer. Her mom's on a flight right now, so she'll be here within hours. And anyway, Mr. Charles is the one who suggested she stay. And we're not going to let down one of our neighbors at a time like this, are we? Get a couple of sheets and a pillow, would you? I hesitated, then used... My top to pull up in the door to the linen closet. Sheets, duvets, towels, and pillowcases were stacked up to the ceiling. Dad delivered Casey to the top of the stairs. Here we are, one little girl, ready for bed. I'll just leave you to it then, Sheila. Looks like you guys got it under control. He went back downstairs, humming to himself. Casey had her head tucked low and her doll clutched under her chin. Neely done, Casey, love. Pass me some sheets then, Matthew. Don't just stand there. I didn't move. I don't know which ones. I said. Mom huffed and grabbed what she needed. Would you like a glass of water for the night, Casey? Yes, please. Wow, she's a pretty thing, isn't she? Pointing at the doll clearly wasn't a pretty thing after all the dunking in the pond. Has she got a name? Casey shrugged, then looked straight at me. Goldie, she whispered. Goldie, ah, oh, that must be because of her um beautiful hair. Right. You wait here with Matthew while I go get your water. We all know that She's saying Goldie for goldfish. Um, and she was saying Matthew's name, right? She wasn't saying that the doll's name was Goldie. As soon as Mom left, Casey stared at me in big, big O shape with her mouth and smacked her lips together. Is that your tank, goldfish boy? She said, looking over my shoulder into the bedroom. Remember, this child is seven and Matthew is 12, okay? So here the way she is talking to him. Smack, smack, smack. Doesn't it get boring swimming around there all day? Up and down, up and down, up and down. My eyes were stinging. How is it any of your business? Smack, smack, smack. She followed me to my door. 
Have you got any of those little treasure chests in there that open and close with bubbles, hmm, little fishy? She tried to look past me into my room, but I stood in her way. Tilting her head to one side, she screwed her eyes up at me. How can you still breathe when you're out of your tank, goldfish boy? Why don't you die? I snatched a doll from her arms and she gasped. I can breathe a lot better than your brother could when you push him in the pond, you evil little witch. Give her back! She tried to grab the doll, but I held it out of her reach. Germs scurried down my arms. What have you done to him, eh? Where's Teddy? What have you done to your brother? The little girl went scarlet and her feet beat the carpet. I want her back! Give her to me now! I could hear Mom starting on the stairs. Is everything all right? I gripped the doll's head and twisted it till it made an awful cracking noise and flopped to one side. I then thrust it into her chest and slammed my door. So... That's a side of, of Matthew we've never seen before. He was kind of mean to Casey, but she was kind of mean to him too. So not that that evens out, but that's a very realistic um, response for children, I would think. I woke sweating at 2.18 a.m. I needed to wash again. I could still feel the doll's matted hair on my hand. Riddled and dr like dried up seaweed. The house was silent as I quietly opened the door, peeking in on Casey. She had both of her arms stretched high above her head. Her mouth was open and dried with chalky saliva. Her eyes suddenly opened and I jumped. Goldfish boy? I ignored her and turned toward the bathroom, but she carried on. The old lady's got him, goldfish boy. I stepped into the room. What do you mean? What old lady? Her face was blank. Her eyes closed again. Casey, do you know who took Teddy? She frowned in her sleep and then, holding the doll to her chest, rolled over and turned her back to me. Through the open curtain, I looked down at old Nina's house. It was darker than usual. Something was different. I was just about to turn away when I realized what it was. The yellow lamp, the one that glowed all day and night in the front room, wasn't glowing anymore. It had been switched off. All right. That is our read aloud for today. I know it was a little bit longer than yesterday's by about 20-ish minutes. But um, I think that we have a few revelations here. And I think something that I want you guys to reflect on today in your journals, in your reading journals, I want you to reflect on the question, how do you feel about Casey? Is she a good older sister? Is she a bad older sister? Why is she different? Why is she not like a normal older sister? Because if, personally for me, if I had a sibling that was missing, I would be crying. I would be really upset. I know that for a lot of you all, a lot of your siblings would be really upset if you guys went missing too. And it's very clear that Casey doesn't really seem to care. Um, and her coming over to um, Matthew's house, that's probably a big deal for him. So I want you guys to reflect on Casey being at his house and how what that means. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow for tomorrow's read aloud. Bye, guys.